Hello, everyone. Welcome to Leathertainment Podcast. I am your host, Tanner Leatherstein here. Today, we have Dr. Kerry Sr., the director of Leather UK. With us, we're going to discuss the environmental impact and sustainability of leather. He has a ton of experience academically and, and from the industry. Um, to talk about this, I'm very excited to learn much more about this subject that I'm really not qualified enough yet. And um, I think we can get to know him first. Kerry, would you like to start with introducing yourself and then I will start my questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm Kerry Senior. As you say, I'm the director of Leather UK, which is the trade association for the UK leather industry, covering supply chain from raw materials to finished products. I'm also secretary of the International Council of Tanners, which is a supranational organization which brings together the national associations of different leather producing countries and represents about 50% of the world's leather production. Um, by background, I am an environmental scientist. Uh, I worked for BLC Leather Technology Center for 10 years in their environmental department doing research, which is also where I did my PhD, uh, looking at energy pipe solutions uh, for difficult chemicals in uh, tannery affluence. Um, and now I am here um, representing the leather industry as best as I can. That's awesome. It's a, it's a great background. Um... Well, it, it's an interesting field. I think very uh, tanneries and leather is already a less known subject. And the, the, the biochemistry of it, the environmental I impact is even lesser known subject. A lot of people has opinions and, you know, just maybe uh, heard a couple of things about like tanneries are polluting the environment. It's not good for, you know, for life, for the world. But even me being in the leather industry so much, I don't know the details of this, uh, this, this aspect. Like we, I know that we use the water treatment plants and everything, but I really don't understand what's harmful about the environment, how it is get, getting cleaned and what's, what's, what needs to be done, what's being done, what's not being done. So I'm really excited to learn all about this stuff. So why don't we start with um, what is harmful to the environment in the tanning process. Let's start with that one first, and then we can go on like how we deal with it. Okay, um, if you're talking about the, the sort of within the factory um, manufacturing leather, um, as with any manufacturing process, a, a lack of regulation, a lack of control in the process has the potential to cause harm. Um, so if we are, not treating effluents, for instance, and they're being discharged straight into rivers. Um, even what you might view as a relatively benign effluent from, say, a veg tannery, which is made up of, you know, oak bar extracts, can cause significant harm in um, if it's discharged and treated directly into a watercourse. But what we need to remember is that, um, contrary to what seems to be popular opinion out there, is that the leather industry doesn't get a pass on meeting its environmental obligations. So, I mean, all around the world, whatever you do, there are stringent environmental regulations that control um, how you um, treat your affluent, how you dispose of waste, how you protect workers in factories from exposure to chemicals and the like. And the tanning industry is a subject to those regulations as you know, strongly and in exactly the same way as every other industry. <clears throat> So the, what can go wrong is a, there's a vast spectrum of things that can go wrong, obviously, because we, we have energy, we have chemicals, we have machinery, we have people, we have effluents, we have solid wastes. Any of these things, if they're not properly dealt with, represents a hazard. But the point of it all is that because of the, the legislative burdens that we have, it's not an issue. Um, that's in broad terms, and we, we all know that there are examples um, which are frequently flung up um, where good practice isn't being followed and while we are seeing harm is being done. Um, and that's entirely unacceptable. Uh, I wouldn't support that in any way, shape or form. But, and without trying to give the, you know, excuse it in any way, we have to bear in mind this is often uh, due to bigger problems than simply the tanning industry. It's usually associated in areas where there is poor regulation or poor um, 
enforcement of regulation. And that's not just with the tanning sector, it's with any manufacturing sector. So, for instance, if you go to the Citroen River in Indonesia, it's a toxic cesspit. That's caused by the textile sector because there is no control over what they're discharging into, into the river. Um, and that's symptomatic of a much bigger problem that we face in the world associated with globalization, with a drive for ever cheaper products, and with a, probably a sense of distance that we have from the places where some of our products are made. But talking That's about the tanning right. sector, but talking about the tanning sector, um, for the very large part of the tanning sector is done very well. Uh, and tanneries are always pushing for greater efficiencies uh, in how they deal with issues around waste treatment. For, you know, even for the most base reason that you know, if you're efficient, you're more cost effective. So you save money, you can even make money, but also because we want our product to be, you know, a good product for the modern world. That's all that's about. That's, that's, that's true. Like it's not only tenor industries, but for some reason it feels like the leather industry gets a bigger backlash from just general public, like tanneries are polluting the environment. I don't know where or how that came from. I'd, I'm not sure if textile is getting the same um, same kind of claims, is it? No. Um, but, I mean, everybody is in the spotlight now, and quite rightly. Um, there is an awful lot of moves being made, regulatory moves being made to ensure that things are done better across the board. I think the reason that leather is often targeted is simply because we're an animal byproduct. So if you look at the groups that tend to attack leather, their agenda is driven by um, animal rights, animal welfare. Um, it's an agenda um, to see any animal product taken out of production. Uh, and obviously a lever for that is to attack uh, the environmental record of the product, to paint a product as toxic or harmful. Um, and that's why it's done. Um, if you were looking at it from a purely scientific point of view, you, there are aspects which you can improve, obviously, but that's a, that's a, a natural process. Uh, but the attacks are driven by agendas uh, around, which don't really relate to leather, but attack leather because we are associated with the meat industry. That's, that's right. So that, that goes on to the other side of the thing. Uh, there's, I think, two major attack points one is the environmental impact second is from the animal side animals are being killed for their leathers so yeah. i think the second one is this is the worst one to me it's it's not it's it's not a fact it's it's uh i think completely made up reason but unfortunately it's being told so loudly by some of these groups everywhere internet and it may appear that way to some people especially when you go out there in the you know a luxury mall and you see a bag made out of leather cost three thousand dollars you might be automatically thinking oh leather is so expensive that's why they're killing animals for mm -hmm. you know economical reasons right but one of the things i'm trying to tell people like leather is not that expensive it's not a cheap product but it's never that expensive and mm -hmm. i'm going to make further contents about this but what can you tell to help us understand or demystify that animals are killed for their leather uh, nonsense? <laughs> it, well, it's true. I, and I think one of the things I like about what you do is um, is draw the attention to the fact that if you're buying a luxury product, it's not the leather you're buying; it's the it's the brand is the big thing. You know, I mean that's and that's absolutely fine. You know, there's an awful lot of cachet in a Louis Vuitton bag, for instance. Okay, but as as you point out, the leather in there is not worth three thousand dollars <laughs> otherwise there'd be a lot of rich tanners out there um, oh yeah i will allow <laughs> i i will allow that to be <laughs> as far as the byproduct angle goes um no one is rearing livestock for the hide or the skin okay um if you look at what the definition of a byproduct is it's, it's defined by intent so when you rear an animal you're rearing it for the meat and the hide is produced incidentally to that because it's inevitable uh, that when you kill the animal you need to take the skin off to get to the meat okay well obviously we know that money talks that's where the issue is so if we look at what it means in terms of the value chain 
Hide currently on the global uh, on a global average is worth about one percent of the live weight of the animal at slaughter. Okay, it's virtually nothing, and that's assuming it has a value at all. <clears throat> the best estimate we have is that somewhere in the region of about forty to forty-five percent of hides are thrown away every year. Now, uh, some of that is down to things like infrastructure. So if you look at Africa, which has one of the biggest populations of livestock on the planet, so about 20% of the world's livestock is in Africa, they don't have the infrastructure to collect and process hides. So in a place like Ethiopia, it's estimated that less than 50% of hides are even collected, and of those, only 75% will then be processed. So you're talking nearly two-thirds of the hides are simply thrown away. That's an infrastructure issue. But then we also know that in the US, which has a very mature and integrated industry, 20% of the hides are being thrown away every year because they don't have a market. We also know that some hides which are you know, of the lowest quality are being prepared for the leather industry and sold at a loss because it's cheaper to do that than to landfill. Now, as soon as that dynamic changes, we'll see more hides being thrown away. Okay. So the hide is, you know, no one is going to produce, uh, you know, hides you know, or rear animals rather to produce the hide alone. It just wouldn't work economically. And there's been research done at the University of Montana that's looked at the uh, relationship between the rearing and slaughter of animals and demand for hides in the U.S. and Brazilian markets. And in both cases, it has no direct influence on the number of animals being reared and slaughtered. Okay, doesn't make a difference. Um, so it's, the hide is undoubtedly a byproduct. If you get down to small skins, like sheepskin, it's even worse, much, much worse. You know, millions of sheepskin are being thrown away every year at a cost to the abattoir because they have no value. In the UK, we produce something like 14 million sheepskin a year. Maybe half of those have a value, a very trivial value for the double face market in China. The rest are being thrown away. In New Zealand at the moment, they are grinding up sheepskin and burying it because it doesn't have a market. It's an awful, wow. awful waste wow. of a raw material. But what it very definitely emphasizes is that the hide or the skin is a byproduct at best. And in, mo in a lot of cases, it's simply a waste. Um, right. And the problem is, of course, where, these, where we're seeing a shift away from leather, um, what this means is that this raw material is just being lost and it's being substituted, in the, for the most part, with synthetics um, mostly plastics is, mostly plastics which is not the direction of travel that we need to be going yeah so this is great topic we came along now here i have a couple more questions to follow up sure. i didn't know half of the hides well two-thirds of the hides were being you know wasted in africa because of the infrastructure which i understand 20 percent in us um, is done because it's not worth it and and all that stuff so um what's the way that waste is handled and what's the uh process or impact of that because you know it's almost like the meat you left outside it's going to putrefy it with bacteria and all that stuff it could be an infectious disease source as well right if it's not managed well so how it's do you properly dispose these things and yeah it's potentially a hazardous waste um some will be landfilled uh simply buried um some is rendered uh, and you can recover components from that, like fats and proteins. Uh, we're seeing um, a growth in the collagen industry. So a lot of tanners are, a lot of people that appreciate this, that collagen and gelatin uh, quite often starts in the tannery. So you take, a, you take a hide, you lime it, split it, that drop split can then be sold, if it's kept to food grade standards, can then be sold into um, the collagen and gelatin industry, so where you have massive customers like Haribo. Uh, and indeed, you can, after processing, recover uh, collagen for you know um, technical applications. So it's in there for food, it's in there for pharmaceuticals, it's in there for technical. So you, there are, there's options to recover it. But for the most part, it's simply buried uh, or incinerated, um, right. which is not an ideal solution to any problem. No, it's not. And especially if you think about it, like this, this raw height could have been done into something. It could have been leather. It could have been yep. a gelatin. It could have been collagen going into something. Yep. And by not using this natural resource that was came about incidentally, 
um, you have to produce other stuff now. Like you have to do other manufacturing with from different sources. So I think okay. there is a big inefficiency there by not using something you already have, you know, not upcycling it. Uh, we, we could probably do better there. We could absolutely could. And the other problem with that, of course, is, is when we start talking about um, people looking to improve the environmental profile of their products by moving away to leather to materials that have an apparently lower environmental impact. So if you, if you, if leather has an impact of 10 and you move to an, a material that has an impact of five, for your product, you might have reduced the impact. But if you look at it in the broader picture, that leather, that height is still produced. It's still going to be there. Um, and if it doesn't get used, it's still going to have an impact. So you, you have to, I mean, you'd have to run the numbers, obviously. But the question is, if you're making one raw material, if you're making two raw materials and not using one, are you actually just making the situation worse? But as far as the numbers for your product go, it looks better. As far as the planet goes, it might not be. That's right. That's right. It's very interesting, but I'm glad like we were able to bring that into some people's attention um, to put light into that fact that animals are being killed for um, their skins, which this may be true for a super small percentage of leathers, which is exotics, uh, maybe the chinchillas, uh, maybe the the super exotic crocodiles or things like that. Right. Like that, that there might be a truth to this, but. How small it is in the entire leather scheme, if you have any information about it? Well, we usually, the, the working figure is less than 1%. You know, it's a, it is a very tiny part of what we do. Um, um, and to be fair, it's also more complicated um, than it appears at face, face value, because you could say, okay, these animals are just being killed for their skins. And that's true. Um, but if you look at the work that's been done by, for instance, Professor Graham Webb in the Northern Territories of Australia, by harvesting crocodiles for their skins to make leather in that area, they've actually conserved the species. Um, at the beginning of the last century, um, as farmland in the Northern Territories was expanding, people were running up against very large crocodiles <laughs> in Australia, you know, very big, dangerous animals. Uh, and they were treated as a pest mm. and they were culled. And the population dropped by about 97 percent okay so they wow. were dancing along the edge of extinction uh, in australia um in the northern territories anyway uh, and at that point um it was in the 70s any environmental uh, groups stepped in and it began they put protection onto these animals and obviously the population started to grow again and you start to have problems where they bump up against humanity what they've done is to start farming the animals, okay? And what that means is that you are conserving the species, you're conserving the habitat, it's given jobs to indigenous people, okay? Which means you're satisfying a number of UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and the population now is back up to 100%, even though they're farming them to make leather. So that, it's... It sounds slightly mercenary, but as far as the species goes, for those crocodiles in the Northern Territories, being used to make leather has actually guaranteed their future. That's... And we're also seeing, seeing, seeing similar things with if you look at alligator populations in some of the American states, which have um, fell down from down to sort of hundreds of thousands of populations in similar swamplands. They're back up to millions because they're being used to make leather. The environment's being conserved. In areas like Florida, where they we have lots of invasive species, you know, snake species are being taken out um, to protect the environment, and they're being used to make leather. Um, now, clearly, we know that doesn't apply to the entirety of the exotic market, uh, and some animals are simply farmed, um, which may have some questionable ethics around it. Uh, but what it shows is that. You have to really understand what you're dealing with, what your supply chain is, um, to see really what is happening. Because as soon as you, if those supply chains were to stop, the value to the local people in conserving the species and conserving the environment could disappear. Uh, and then you might see you know, species being pushed to the edge of extinction as um, they start being killed as a pest and as their environment starts getting turned into farmland or housing or whatever. 
So it's it's the exotics one is a complicated area. It is a complicated area, and maybe to help people who like exotic skins, but you know don't want to be part of animals being killed or brutally or unethical ways uh, employed in this way. What can they watch out for? Like, how, what's the best way or any organization certification you might uh, recommend them to quickly, you know, just check a couple of things before they make a purchase? On exotics, uh, I'll be quite honest, I'm not aware um, of what sort of standards you would have um, to give you that confidence that it's come from one of those sort of uh, more sustainable routes. Um, but I suspect that, you know, particularly at that price point in the market, there'll probably be a very comprehensive story attached to it anyway. So I think if you understand that there are options, you can go look for them. Um, right, and, exactly. Uh, brands using maybe, that kind of leather want to tell you. Uh, absolutely. And maybe the brand brands and, and stories of the brands might be a good way to ensure, you know, yeah. at least bigger brands are much more responsible of selecting their vendors, where their leather is coming from as well. In the exotic space, one might be a little bit uh, more confident in, in their choice you're going with in the exotic uh, leather purchases if you're choosing with a big brand than, you know, just one off shop, I believe. Uh, unless there is there is a certification, I, I I'm aware of one a certification called Sites, which is the um, trafficking of the endangered species leathers around the world. Uh, they kind of make sure, but I don't know how how clearly it protects everything. Sites would give you the confidence that it's not from an endangered species. Okay, so you would know that if it's if it's a site, Sites protects species that are um, at risk of becoming extinct or endangered um so that would give you the confidence that the leather you've got has come from an animal that isn't you know on the brink of extinction you know or its populations aren't struggling but it wouldn't necessarily give you the confidence about where it had been reared or, or sourced um but that said it's still a better choice than one that isn't CITES registered because obviously then at least you know that you've got an animal there that you're not, you're not driving something towards you know the end of the species. That's right, that's right. Okay, so going back to the leather, now we have this byproduct of the meat industry. And as you said, nobody raises a cow for 1% of the economical value. You know, you, you need to follow the money um, because decisions are made because of money, uh, because we eat meat, a lot of people, I eat meat and I create this demand for the meat. Somebody uh, gets down and raises a cow and meat is not only economical benefit out of this picture either. There is the dairy industry, which is probably close to or maybe as big as meat industry, right? The cows give the milk, the cheese and all that stuff before we get to the leather. So now we get the leather what happens in that stage? Because as soon as it, it falls off the animal, it is, you know, the clock is ticking down backwards. It's, it's going to petrify itself in, in a very short, short term. How it is handled until it goes to the tannery, like what happens? And if, if those preventative measures doesn't uh, apply, like what's, what's the destiny of that leather? Well, there's, I mean, the, the, the most common form, obviously, for the most common thing that happens to a hide after it comes off an animal is it, it's cured. So either it'll be brined or it'll be covered in salt, dry salted, wet salted to ensure it's preserved. Okay, and then if you if you do that uh, and you properly salted a hide, you can keep it you know, for weeks, uh, which is how hides obviously are transported across to you know from the, uh, the U.S. to China. Um, and the like. Um, other options include chilling. Uh, so, you know, some of the tanneries in the UK are using chilled hides, so it comes off the animal into a chiller wagon and is set, taken to the tannery in a matter of hours. Now, obviously, that requires much more efficient process control because you don't have the time to mess about. Um, you have to get the hide, you know, into process pretty quickly. Um, but we know what happens if it doesn't get treated and looked after properly, it will start to rot. Um, and as soon as that happens, then you're not going to make good leather from it. Um, you know, it'll start to delaminate. It will start, worst case, you'll start to even get holes. And you can't really do anything with a hide like that. 
And then, of course, it becomes a bit of a, it's potentially hazardous because you have a, you know, in the same way you've got a piece of rotting meat, a rotting hide is not a pleasant object uh, and it needs to be correctly disposed of. Yeah, yeah but exactly. Typically, the worms, the flies, everything comes about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, um, you know, in my part of the world, you know, up here that would take some time, but there are parts of the world where that can happen very, very quickly. And certainly small skins, you know, sheepskin, if you turn your back on it, they can start to start to putrefy. It's, uh, it's a very rapid process. Yeah, exactly. And especially like if it's not salted, brined or cured, you know, that little bacterial uh, activity on that, your grain is almost being eaten by the bacteria every minute. And as you said, the, even if you take it after that point, the leather grain will be very damaged and you're not going to get a good leather out of it. You know, probably not worth even processing or spending money on the chemicals to tan it at that point. So it's yeah. an incre incredibly crucial step to cure it timely store it timely manner so it it's actually preserved to be something significant again out of it yeah i mean i don't know what the level of loss is in the industry but um you know i think it, it's it's a process that we, we're you know it's been running for a very long time we're very familiar with so i would i would expect for the most part you know in uh unorganized abattoirs and tanneries it's it's not such an issue um right these days no. Right, we're but pretty. Other, part, other parts of the world, you know, if you look at other parts of the world, you know, where, where we're still um, back to this lack of infrastructure. Clearly, lots of material will be lost simply because there is nothing to do with it and no way of preserving it, uh, and it will just be left to rot. Exactly. So now we, we let's say we preserve the leather, we carry it to the tannery, or we transport it. You know. A, Maybe a lot of people may not know this. Um, sometimes I get this question when I was in Turkey. Uh, do, do, does Turkey have enough leathers to to make in the tanneries? People ask me sometimes. Well, well, it doesn't work that way. We don't have to have raw hides in the in our own country of the tannery. There is a huge international trade of raw hides. I was you know going on these road trips with my father when I was uh, you know super little. We bought sheepskins from South Africa, we bought sheepskins from Argentina, you know, UK, Europe, everywhere they just flood in. Wherever this uh, tannery industries are established, uh, there are a few major countries like Italy. I think uh, Italy has a large tannery population. Turkey has a lot. Um, I think mm -hmm. India, China, Pakistan has a lot of tannery. So they actually draw a lot of leathers from all over the world. So once these leathers move around in that protected state and get to the tannery, now we need to do this thing uh, called tanning and, and to preserve it permanently going forward, right? Like, can you explain a little bit, like, what do we mean by tanning? What do we do there in, in the chemical terms or biological terms? Um, I mean, if we talk, the, the basic process of tanning is, as you say, is to stop the hide rotting. Um, otherwise, you just end up with a terrible, stinking soup. Um, and what we do is use um, a range of chemicals which um, prevent the access of the microorganisms that cause putrefaction. Okay, so you, you're cross-linking, as we call it, which is just basically joining the fibers of collagen together, um, which stops that putrefaction process. And it, 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 they, they work in different ways. Chrome, um, chrome joins the fibers together. Things like veg tans pack out the spaces in leather to stop access. Uh, and what you're basically doing is just making it impossible for microorganisms to get in and begin degrading that material. Um, and then once you've done that, you're in a nice steady state. And um, you know, for unless you put it into um, that uh, something like a composting system, um, where you've got very powerful, you know, uh, biodegrading pro biodegrading processes happening, that leather should stay stable um, indefinitely, um, and that means then obviously, so as you know very well, know you can trade uh, wet blue, uh, which is chrome tan leather, semi finished chrome tan leather, and that can be shipped all the way around the world quite comfortably. Um, you have issues if you start getting it too hot, um, or if you if you if it gets very wet, um, you can have problems. But uh, 
yeah, by that point, it's nicely stable. And then, of course, when we go to the next stages uh, in the leather manufacturing processes where we're taking even more of the water out of the leather, so it's very dry, which is a, not an environment that microorganisms like, and then we're adding more chemicals to finish and process it, and you end up with the beautiful leather we all like and love, um, which will, as I say, last for a very, very long time. Right. That's exactly it's, it's a nice summary of leather's journey in the tannery. So I have a few questions in there uh, for the tanning methods. That's another uh, discussion I see online. Uh, people have opinions about chrome tanning. People have opinions about vegetable tan. You know, there's trends along, you know, marketing um, talks. So what's the, the general difference between chrome tanning, vegetable tanning, and what other tannings that are there maybe some people may not know? And any uh, benefits and pros and cons, nothing is perfect, pros and cons of it from a leather standpoint, <laughs> then we're going to talk about the environmental and tannery aspects of those tanning methods. There is a, a misconception that somehow tanning leather is, is just it's just one process with different chemicals and you get the same result. Um, you don't. Um, the different tanning chemistries, um, if we talk about the three broad groups, which is um, sort of mineral tanning, like chromium tanning, syn tanning, which is the, the sort of wet whites, things like uteraldehyde, formaldehyde, or the more advanced uh, sulfonate based synthetic tans, uh, and veg tanning. Uh, they give different results. Uh, you, in, in, in broadest terms, you, if you, the choice of tannage should be determined by what you want the leather to do. Okay, so if you're making sole leather, for instance, you're in for the, for the bottom of a shoe, you need a leather that's very dense, very hard, very hard wearing. Veg tan is great for that. Um, but you wouldn't use uh, that kind of leather to make a jacket. <laughs> For instance, you know, it'd be unwearable unless you were trying to make a suit of armor. Um, whereas uh, chrome tanning uh, produces a much more flexible um, leather, uh, which is lighter. Um, it also has a what we call a higher shrinkage temperature, which means it has a greater resistance to heat, uh, which can be important in things like the lasting processing, making shoes, uh, which involves quite a lot of heat. Um, and then, and then you have syntan, synthetic tan materials, wet white. They are called wet white because they quite literally come out white. Uh, they're very good for if you want to get very bright colors. They also have different performance for uh, what we call dimensional stability. So um, and one example that I've been given by the auto manufacturers is that if you're making a car, um, the panel that sits directly in front of the windscreen on top of the dashboard, it's often better to use wet white there for the leather because apparently it has better stability to sunshine. So you imagine if you're taking, you're selling a, you know, a Land Rover to Saudi Arabia, which is going to be sat in brutal sunshine all the time. You don't want that panel to start shrinking or deforming. And wet white, right. um, advised, gives much better performance in that particular area. So it's about what you want the leather to do. Um, that's that, that determines what tannage you should use, and there's an awful lot of nuance in there as well. Um, you know, you can you can mix tannages up. So you know, quite often, chrome tan you know, chrome tans will be re, re tanned with a syn tan to give different performances, depending on what it is you want the leather to do. And, and it's it's the, the spectrum of things that can be achieved is quite extraordinary. Right when. You know, people think about leather, leather is leather, you know, um, especially if they want to get into leather working or stuff like that. They reach out to me or, or some other people like, hey, I, I want to get into leather work. Like, what kind of leather I need to buy? Like, OK, what are you going to make? Uh, if you're going to make a wallet, it's a different thing. If you're going to make a shoe or, or upholstery, yeah. it's it's whole different game. There's tannings involved, the substances, the colors, all the requirements. So. Definitely, it's, it's a wide, deep world, all these tanning methods in itself. I've done a lot of chrome tanning in my life, double face and the, the sheepskins, cowhide, but I haven't done a lot, anything with white, uh, the wet white, the, the synthetic tannins. Uh, I have done a little bit of veg tanning myself, but it's it's a whole specialty in itself. You need to you know dedicate your life to one channel and then keep learning at it. It's just vast knowledge areas. Yeah. 
It is. I mean, in the UK, we have um, we have a, a tannery uh, which specialises only in oak bark tanning. Uh, they only use oak bark for their tannage. It's a pure tannage, um, and they make an absolutely spectacular leather, which is being used by some of the, you know, the most luxurious brands in the world um, because of its particular properties. Um, you know, and it's you couldn't do uh, what they're doing with that leather with a creme tan leather, for instance. Um, but equally, you couldn't turn that leather into you know, a pair of gloves. Uh, it would be, you know, it would be impossible. Um, right. So it's, right. it, it is about understanding, firstly, what it is that the leather needs to do, and then work backwards to how you're going to make it. Yeah, exactly. That's great. So one question just popped into my mind here. Um, leather is at the beginning it's it's you know it degrades itself you know you you bury it and then it's gone um uh, it is right like it's completely gone like there is no harmful leftover from the raw hide being buried am i right or am i making an assumption here no i mean a raw hide is an organic material okay so right. if you were to bury one in the, in, the, in the field or in the garden it would rot away and it would you, you know you would you would return to nature it's, it's, to use flowery language, it would be, you know, it's part of the circle of life. Um, you wouldn't want a huge stack of them in your back garden, obviously, but um, essentially, yeah, there is no, there is no um, hazard um, innate to a, to a raw hide because it is an organic product. Right. Uh, so and what happens product. after we, we, we tend them, like we, we tend them with chrome, we tend them with wedge tan or, or synthetics, do, do they stay if we bury them do they biodegrade themselves at some point even if it's really long or or they will just stay stable for a really long time or forever uh, no the, the broad answer uh, this is a question that comes up a lot uh, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about this and um, leather is biodegradable that is the that is the broad answer leather is biodegradable um, the caveats in that are around what it's made with so um, veggie tan leather, for instance, is much more resistant to biodegradation than chrome tan leathers. Um, because I'm it's, surprised by that. Everyone always is. Um, there's a kind of <laughs> assumption, but because of the because of the nature of the way it's tanned, it's much more resistant to the penetration of organisms, uh, microorganisms, which carry out the biodegradation. Um, but that said, um, when it does degrade, it, it makes a, it contributes fantastically to uh, soil, for instance. The second uh, thing here is it depends on the route of biodegradation. Okay, so if, you, um, if you're composting, are you doing an industrial composting system where you might be operating at 60 degrees? Are you doing a garden composting system which would be operating at a much lower temperature perhaps? Um, is it buried in a landfill uh, where the conditions will be very different? Uh, um, it'll be dark, it'll be cold, there'll be no oxygen, so the, the process is different. And then finally, it depends on what you've done with the leather. So if you uh, made a patent leather, for instance, we know a patent leather is going to have a quite a substantial finishing layer on top of it to, to give it that high gloss finish. Okay, That would right. interfere with the biodegradation process. Okay, um, As opposed to something like a bruschetta leather, which is, you know, virtually naked, you know, an aniline leather with very little. Yeah. That will that will degrade much quicker because you don't have those um, uh, synthetic chemical interferences to slow the process down, um, and you will have no residue from a material like that. Whereas something which has, say, a little, you know, as we know, if you're looking at a, an upholstery ladder where you've got a very fine layer of PU on top of it for the, to give it that performance, that layer of PU will be left after the leather is gone. Um, yeah. you know, ultimately, it will degrade. Um, but it will take a lot longer than the actual level. Um, there is um, some research we've been doing through uh, COTANCE, uh, the European Association, and also sponsored by Leather UK, my association, on the uh, biodegradation of leather uh, and some other materials. Uh, I don't want to go into the results too deeply now, but they're being published very shortly. Um, but it's very, very interesting to look at spectrum. What is clear is that um, Synthetic materials cannot compete with leather on the biodegradability. Uh, and the 
the uh, more natural, if you like, the leather is. Uh, you know, the fewer you know, the fewer finishing chemicals, the, 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 the fewer additives, uh, the quicker it goes. And we're also seeing, <clears throat> interestingly, um, as part of the sort of development of the industry, tanning chemistries that are coming out now, which are degrade in next to no time. So recently, a company called Shilin Shilaker produced uh, a tanning chemistry based on a sugar. It's a non-food wow. sugar waste from, from the industry. If you just tan a piece of skin with that and don't do anything else to it, it will degrade, biodegrade in a composting situation in a matter of days. Okay, gone. Wow. Complete. Okay, so to come back to the first point, yes, even after we've done what we do to it, leather remains biodegradable. Uh, how biodegradable will vary, but ultimately, get a piece of leather returned to nature will be gone. Um, which is why we don't, you know, can't, yeah, sure. That, that's a relief thing to me. Like, um, I wasn't sure about, about the answer of, of this question. So, if people ask me, like, can leather be biodegradable after chrome tan? I, I didn't know. I, I So, thank you for the answer. And I, it kind of relieves me. It just makes me happier because now eventually leather lasts a long time we use it 20 30 40 years maybe if you if you wanted to but once you throw it out you know knowing that it's going to go back into the circle of life it's perfect right and the more <laughs> natural it is the less finish of it like the, the way i love it the way i keep preaching to people you know if you don't see and feel the leather it's plastic you know you can use anything underneath it's it's not that special to me the truly special leathers show that you know, character of the leather, imperfections and all that, which means there's not much done on top in terms of makeup, which will biodegrade the stuff probably even quicker. And I, I've heard those new tanning techniques. I've heard about a zeol, zeolite uh, tanning. Zeolite, yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah, another one. Like, if, you, if, you just, if you just take a piece of skin, a hide and tan it, it's another one. It, it, it degrades extremely quickly. In composting conditions, um, uh, so these and this is the way, this is the way the industry is moving. I mean, obviously, most leather is chrome tanned. Chrome tanned leather will biodegrade. Um, if you're composting, you have an, uh, you end up with a compost uh, with a chrome tanned leather which has um, quite a high chrome content, which means there are difficulties in using it as a compost on the land. Um, if you if you use a veg tanned based compost, uh, the results that we've seen in our studies is that you'll actually get twenty percent better plant growth. You know, wow. the, um, it, it really contributes to the, the the quality of the soil that you add it to. It's fantastic. This is the direction of travel we're seeing in the industry with regard to chemicals generally. So we're seeing new tanning chemistries coming out. Um, we're also starting to see new finishing chemistries coming out, much more um, bio-based materials. And obviously the advantage of that is that they will be more biodegradable than fossil fuel-based materials. So as soon as we start to see tanning chemicals being replaced by these new chemicals, it's likely that the biodegradability of the level will improve even more. Um, so there's, there is... A, there's a, a process towards you know, making the material even better than it already is. Exactly. So this is actually a great point, which makes me appreciate these attacks on leather industry, right? These people say, hey, leather is not sustainable. It's harmful to environment. Leather is coming from, you know, animal. Animals are being killed. They're not treated fine. The tanning industry is doing this pollution. So which makes us push like even further to find better ways to make it more sustainable, you know, better ways of tanning. I think there is a value to these claims as well. So maybe we need to thank those people who who sometimes create these false claims in the tanning industry by giving people more reasons to innovate and, and do, do stuff that's way better than 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way of looking at it, certainly. Um, but yeah, I think one thing that these attacks have done is that they've, um, they've motivated the industry to start um, being more open and to explain itself and to understand what it is that we do. Because um, 
until recently, if you were looking at, for information on the biodegradability of leather, for instance, it'd be very hard to find anything, anything formal. We all knew it was biodegradable. It was very difficult to point to something that said, there's the evidence. Um, and what we've been doing in recent years is um, looking at the different aspects of concern around leather, doing the studies and addressing them. And we've seen it um, with the Philk report, which you may have heard of, uh, which looked at the performance aspects of leather. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that was a great piece of work. Uh, we're seeing it with the biodegradation work that's being done. We're also looking at the bio-based content of leather um, compared to other materials. Um, there's been a lot of work done on the life cycle analysis of leather. And it's, it's some of the, you know, some of the finest tanneries, the best processes in the world have been handing over their data um, so we can build a picture of what the environmental impact of leather actually is. Um, and these things weren't there. And by doing this, we're just building this suite of information that supports the case for using leather. Okay. We've got the evidence now it's a byproduct. You can show it's biodegradable. You can show the process can be benign. You can, you know, there are still things that need to be addressed. Um, we need better traceability for our raw materials, um, which is, an issue because the leather industry is taking a byproduct, um, which you know our, our suppliers aren't that worried about. But there will be more pressure on that in the future with regulation. But basically, we're, we're getting to a point where we can tell a very good story about the leather um, to show that it is an ideal choice for the, the slow, reduced purchasing world that we need to be living in. Exactly. So this is perfect. It's leather is slow fashion. That's that's what I um, tell people. Like people ask me, like the company is in fast fashion using leather. Well, I don't think it's a good fit. Leather is gonna last a long time. It's gonna not work against your goals, right? You, you the person is not gonna purchase again next month. So yeah. I think if if you're trying to be a fast fashion brand, probably use something else. Leather is not the choice. Um, ideally, whatever is made with leather is 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 gonna last a long time. It's not gonna be as cheap either, so it's not a good fit as a material. But uh, overall, so there there are other things that came up in the in the last answer. You said traceability. What does mm -hmm. it mean? Like I know some of the certifications in the industry uh, enforces this traceability issue. What does it mean? Why is it important? Or if, if anybody uh, f hearing this first time, like, what do they need to know about that? Okay, so traceability is the idea that you can know, um, at the, at the, in the best case, exactly where the animal that your hide or skin came from was reared. Okay, so you can pinpoint it to the farm. That would be, that's the ideal. Okay, and the reason that's important is um, really twofold. One is to avoid issues around animal welfare. Okay, if you know where the skin is coming from, where the hide is coming from, um, you can look back and make sure that the practices on the farm have been have been good. You know, because yes, I mean, you eat meat, I eat meat. Ninety percent of the population eat meat. That doesn't mean that animals. Can just be treated as a commodity. They need to be. They should be looked after and, and given a good life. And I think we all agree on that. Um, and that transparency of the supply chain can give you that confidence that that's happening. Uh, the other issue, and when it's particularly relevant at the moment with emerging legislation, is around issues like deforestation. Okay, so are cattle being reared in areas which have been illegally deforested? And this is a real concern for the brands and, uh, and consumers. They don't want to be associated with, for instance, trees being cut down in the Amazon or uh, Indonesia or wherever. Um, and you need that full traceability, that full transparency to have that absolute confidence um, on that this is not happening in your supply chain. Um, the issue for the industry, unfortunately, is that we are very much secondary consideration as far as that goes. So for meat, you will have a chain of custody that allows you to trace all the way through from the farm to the supermarket where that meat has been. 
that chain of custody ends for the hide at the abattoir when it's removed from the animal. Okay? Because after that, there's no legal obligation to provide that information for the hide. Okay? And so they don't. That makes it very, very difficult for tanners, particularly tanners who are buying from hide traders, who may be getting in, getting in batches of hides and mixing them to know exactly where the material is coming from. Um, and it's it's an issue that needs to be addressed. There are plenty of tanners who are working around that. Um, you know, in the UK we have Scottish Leather Group. They they source all their hides from within about 200 miles of the tannery. Okay, they they have a relationship with the abattoirs. They can tell you which farms the hides came from. Not necessarily down to the animal, but they know which farms that are involved, um, which is great. Uh, if you look at what's happening with Spore in Denmark, which is part of um, the Scanhides um, process, that's a, a far, I believe it's I believe it's a farmer-owned group, and they have full traceability from the farm all the way through to the finished leather because they own it all. Um, it's all there. It's much more difficult if you're talking about, you know, exporting. Say U.S. hides to China, you know, where right. you know, 33 million hides a year being produced in the U.S. and exported all around the world, it becomes more difficult to have that transparency. Um, and we need we need a um, sort of a greater supply of information from our partners in the supply chain to allow us to have that, um, because we can't if we don't have that upstream section from the farm to the abattoir it's impossible for the tanner to then give you that give you that transparency that traceability information but it's starting to happen and with the legislation that's coming along particularly from europe on deforestation i think that will accelerate uh, and we will see greater you know, greater confidence in the supply chain there's also actions being done by uh, groups like the Northern working group who are working with um, other organizations like cotants um, and e-check uh, to um, establish traceability protocols and practices which the industry can use. So we will get there. Per yes, that's another way of another layer of transparency. I think being um, worked on on the leather, especially the rawhide side, which is great. So the more transparency comes, the more confident we all can be about everybody's doing their part to, you know. Yep. have animals have a good life you know environment is not impacted and all all that stuff to clear the name of leather but it seems like the the sounds like the problem to me was the lack of transparency the the mystical aspect of leather you know unknown nature nobody knew about leather they loved it but they didn't know but this was taken as a weak point for like other groups and, and then they are like, they start attacking on those non-transparent aspects of leather. And as we keep making things more clear, like actually it is really good. We just need to tell the story of it, which we didn't before. So this is it's kind of like exactly what's, that. right? It's ex exactly that. Um, and there, there are two very good examples of this. Um, one is Vajra Shoes. So a couple of years ago, Vajra Shoes, um, who are, have an ambition to be as absolutely sustainable as they can. Um, and they take it very seriously. Uh, and they, a couple of years ago, they did, um, uh, they analyzed with the life cycle analysis of their products all the way back to scope three products, scope three emissions, which is the emissions that happen outside of the factory, which for us would be livestock rearing, for instance. Um, and they concluded that the most impactful material they used was leather. Okay. Um, and they, their first sort of noises they were making was that they weren't going to use leather anymore because it was too impactful. What they've actually done is look, take a broader view on what it means. Uh, and instead of abandoning leather, what they've done is source the leather that meets their requirements. So they are now sourcing from farms that they know in Uruguay, uh, I believe, uh, certainly in South America, processing the leather at tanneries that they know. They're bringing it in to make their products. They have full view of their supply chain. And because of that, they have the confidence to use the material. Another example, I don't know if you've seen recently, was with Polestar, the car manufacturer. So when Polestars first came out, they said they weren't going to use leather because they didn't believe it was sustainable. Polestar have an ambition to make very sustainable vehicles, entirely admirable. Uh, and they were going to look at recycled plastics, uh, fishing nets, things like that to make their upholstery. In the Polestar 3, They've come back to leather, 
And the reason they've done that is because they can they found a leather supplier, Richard Weir in Scotland, who can tick all the sustainability boxes that they have, all the needs that they have to understand about the material and traceability, how it's made, um, the environmental impact, how the tannery is run. All of that has been is utterly transparent for them. And it's ticked all the boxes that they need for them to confidently say, to, not only to say that they will use leather, but they will continue to use leather until they can find something that is more sustainable because they can't find anything at the moment. And they're now using leather in That's, the constant market. You know, it's it two, maps two in the great examples. Yeah, and it, what it shows is that you know if you if you if our customers take the time to understand the material and where it's coming from, they can have the confidence to use it. And it's also on us to make sure that we explain ourselves what we do, how we do it, uh, and where it comes from. So that again, they can see that this is a this is a, a good material, uh, and they should be happy to use it. They should be it, it should be a a first choice in most applications but i would say that yeah. absolutely great examples i think i'm gonna look into those two cases later on just to learn from them uh, myself yeah, yeah. later so you mentioned lwg here um just a second ago what what does lwg do what's their certification process like if you, if you have any knowledge to it but i, I yeah. assume you do because you were involved with blc before which runs yeah. lwg i guess right well, lwg is to be clear it's a given misapprehension is a separate company from blc it started at blc um as a as a initiative with, with i believe nike um but what it is now is it, it they, they they LWG builds a protocol and builds and supplies and oversees a protocol for auditing tanneries. Um, the particular focus is environmental practice in tanneries, um, but they are also now building protocols on traceability uh, for raw materials. So what LWG does is give um, ratings to the tanneries on how they're performing in a number of uh, areas of chemical management, energy management, health and safety, that kind of thing. That rating then obviously gives um, gives you uh, an ability to give confidence to your consumers, your customer, about the quality of the way you operate uh, your tannery uh, and that you are operating to the highest possible standards. Um, I, I mean, one thing you have to say is that just because a tannery isn't LWG rated doesn't mean that it isn't operating to a very high standard. You know, for some tanneries, because of the particular uh, groups of customers that seek LWG ratings, for some tanneries, it's not relevant. But that doesn't mean they're operating to a very high standard. So not having LWG rating doesn't mean it's a bad tanner. But it does give confidence to a lot of, to a lot of customers. There are a lot of companies out there that won't work with a leather company unless it's LWG rated. And right. some of them won't work with you unless you are gold rated, which is the top standard. Okay. Right. So what they've done, what the benefit I think of uh, LWG has been, is to give just our customers confidence to use leather, and they now cover, I think, about thirty percent of the world's leather production. So that's that, that's valuable. Um, and there are other systems coming through. Sustainable Leather Foundation is another uh, process. They operate in a different kind of way, but again, it's it's that it's that third party audit that you can show to your customer to say, look. This is where we stand on our environmental practice. You can be sure we're doing things right. And that's important. That is important. Yeah, I think it's a great service. Another level of transparency, as we say here, to mm -hmm. making sure nothing is going wrong over there. And I'm kind of just going back to the Chrome subject, a little bit more just tanning subject. Out of those three tannings, uh, the environmental impact um, in your opinion, like what is the the most difficult one to treat and, and how it is treated in the water plant? What is the proper way of doing this? Like once you, you are a tannery, does the chrome tanning practice, like what do, what do you need to take out from your water and then release it to the environment? And if it's a wedge tan, it's different. If it's if it's wet white, probably it's different. Like in yeah. general terms, like how can you tell us the story? Um. It's different. I mean, so for with veg tanning, um, the process almost treats the effluent because you work from 
very weak liquors up to very strong liquors, and you just move the liquors along. Uh, the, the, when I say liquor, I mean obviously the, 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 the um, mix of chemicals and water that the hide is put in. Um, and you just move them along until they're exhausted, so there's nothing left in them, almost. Um, which is which is quite a nice system in veg tanning. Um, with the other tannages, um, the, the most important thing probably is to make sure you're doing the process right in the first place. Um, if you're achieving uh, what we would call high exhaustion with chemicals, you shouldn't have an awful lot left in your effluent anyway. Um, but then it's about um, treating the effluent to the standard that's required so you can discharge it safely. And that will vary quite a lot depending on where you're discharging to. Um, but for instance, with the chemical, chromium comes in for an awful lot of stick. But if the process is managed properly um, and your effluent is treated properly, it's actually very easy to control. Um, similarly with things like the, uh, the wet whites, uh, that, that's, that's quite a broad spectrum of materials. Um, but even with the, the sort of organic um, organic uh, syntans, the complex organic syntans, um, if you're managing the process properly, it shouldn't really be an issue. And then, obviously, then you have to discharge to whatever standard is required by regulation wherever you're tanning. Um, it's, and we come back to the point where we started, really, is that you don't see this as a problem for the, most of the tanneries in the world, because most of the tanneries in the world are abiding by the regulations that they're subject to. You only see it as a problem where those regulations don't exist or where they're not enforced. Um, and that's what we need to address, um, which is a, a big, you know, is, is a challenge. Um, but as long as, um, as long as you're abiding by the, um, the, the, the relevant regulation, the same as any other industry, then you will not be creating a problem for the environment. That's right. And do we have any numbers like how big of the tanning industry are in that non-regulated or not enforced area? No, no. I mean, it's it's, uh, and I, I I don't want to generalize um, because that's that's wouldn't be fair to do that. Um, you know, there's right. Um, it's there are parts of the world. Um, which um, have greater challenges with these issues than perhaps we would in Europe or in the US, where we are, you know, uh, we have long established processes for dealing with these things. Um, I don't, right. I don't see it as um, it's not a malicious attempt. I think to cause harm or or even negligent. I think it's it's often a question of. Uh, resource um, and unfortunately I think it's often a question with whether these places tend to be where cheaper materials are sourced and because of that they are right. under constant pressure to drive prices down and if you're under pressure to right. push prices down inevitably it becomes a struggle to do things properly that's right that's right okay um, that's that's great like Great information I got from you all this time. I have one last question. This this might be another subject come up on the internet. Uh, some people may have heard the Chrome 6 situation in the Chrome 10 leathers. So yeah. what does Chrome 6 means? When or how often it could be a danger? And how tanneries, today's modern tanneries? I, I know most of the answer, but I would like to hear it from your expertise, and I want people to hear it from, from an expert, not from me. Okay, so in, um, I don't want to get too deep into the chemistry, but um, chromium um, in its salt forms exists uh, in a number of states. Um, the two most common ones are chromium-3 and chromium-6. Chromium-3 is what we use for tanning. Okay, we don't use chromium-6 in tanning. It has no tanning properties on its own. Uh, if you went back 150 years, uh, we had what was called the two-bath technique where you could use chromium-6 for tanning, but what you basically did was reduce chromium-6 to chromium-3. Um, and we, we found a much more efficient way of doing that just by using chromium-3 salts. The problem with chromium-6 is <clears throat> that it exists uh, in a balance with chromium-3. 
and that balance is dictated by the chemical conditions around the material. So if they shift in a certain way, you can actually create chromium-6 from chromium-3. And what that means is that if you have pre-chromium in the leather and the conditions are right, you can create chromium-6 in the leather, even without putting it in. Okay, and that's, but that's what the problem for the industry is. Um, chromium-6 is a carcinogen, um, and it's also a skin sensitizer. The important thing in leather is that chromium-6 is only a carcinogen by inhalation and ingestion. So as long as you're not eating your shoes, you know, chromium-6 isn't an issue. Okay, the issue is that it's a skin sensitizer. It causes contact dermatitis. And that's why in the EU REACH regulations, it is only regulated as a skin sensitizer. Um, whenever, whenever you look at attacks on the industry and they talk about chrome 6, they always talk about it being carcinogen because it's a scary subject. But in fact, it's, it's not an issue in the leather for the consumer wearing a coat, you know, wearing shoes or whatever. Um, chrome 6 does turn up. Um, it can be created in situations where there's been extreme heat or you've got a product exposed to oxidizing compounds. Um, but generally speaking, it's an issue of poorly made leather. Okay? Because if you're making the leather properly, you won't have that high contact of pre-chromium. Um, you can add chemicals that will prevent that process where the chromium-3 oxidizes to chrome-6. So, for instance, we talked about retanning earlier on. If you, you can add a little bit of veg tan to a chrome tan leather after you've tanned it, that actually blocks, well, slows, um, helps prevent that oxidative process. So you won't get chrome six in the leather. Okay. Um, it does turn up, but for the most part, it's not a significant issue. Um, it has to be avoided, obviously. Um, right. And the industry is taking steps. We are looking at new regulation on chromium-6 coming through, uh, which will potentially lower the limit for chromium-6 in leather. And um, because of that, obviously now we are looking at better ways of controlling or preventing production in leather. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for providing that insight, um, clearing that you know fearful. Uh, another attack to, to the leather space, which most of the leather we use are done that way. And we are, we have been tanning leather with chrome, you know, a long time, probably. That's the most practiced and, and perfected way so far, I guess, in the modern era with huge tanneries with all the scientific methodologies. Mm -hmm. So we, we are aware of the issue and we're, I think, doing a pretty good job of preventing that. And um, people can be comfortable using leather products unless they're eating them right <laughs> so yeah, exactly. yeah i mean don't eat, don't, eat your, don't eat your shoes you'll be fine i mean i know it, it's it's always dangerous to speculate but as you say we've been doing the chrome tanning process for, for well over 100 years and it accounts for 80 to 90 percent of the leather that's made in the world if there was a significant issue with this it would have been found by now um, oh, exactly most people are not having problems with using, wearing, sitting on leather products. Right. Awesome. Well, um, Kerry, thank you so much for all the information you provided today. And uh, as the final, when we're saying bye, where can curious people find this information from your organization, maybe Leather UK or any other stuff that you might recommend them to? check out um, if they're curious about any of these things to find some of those research, research papers you, there's, you mentioned. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, on the Leather UK website, there's an awful lot of information. I would also recommend Leather Naturally, uh, One for Leather, um, the Real Leather Stay Different campaign, uh, which is run in the US. Um, the association websites, such as Cotance's website, there's, there's an awful lot of material out there um, and we just need to get better at getting it out to people so they can understand and have confidence in, in that leather is, a, is an ideal choice for a world that we need to move to where we, we buy less and we keep it longer and we repair things. Um, leather is well suited for that which is why it's served us so well for millennia um, and I think perhaps we've forgotten that. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think there was a lot of noise got involved. And when we 
learn how to do a lot of cool things with plastic we got carried away a little bit i think yeah. but now we're realizing yeah. plastic is not that cool in the long run um and when you have an option like leather which is super versatile super durable and this month i think it was earth month and there was some campaigns around it like hashtag buy it for life and i think leather is the perfect material for this you know you buy it you buy it for life you don't need to buy five more times if if you were to choose an, a different alternative so yeah. thanks for bringing all this up and helping people understand and explore leather space a little better mm -hmm.